We have a rather interesting subject this morning. When, when I was at Calcutta, I saw a very beautiful temple. It was one of the most elaborate, I guess, in the city. And it cost a lot of money. And it was comparatively recent. And I found out that it belonged to the sect of the Jain, a comparatively small group, between two and a half and three million, but with very great interesting peculiarities. I found the first peculiarity when I decided to go and take a look. Before I got into the building, I was stopped. And I was asked to remove my shoes, my belt, and my wallet. And to put them all on a bench on the edge of a main thoroughfare and walk off and leave them. Well, for Westerners, that was a, a, a critical moment. <laughs> but in the atmosphere of the giant, it seemed reasonable. Other people did it. I noticed several pairs of shoes along on a bench and several wallets. So I did was instructed and uh, found out afterwards that nothing that involves animal skin or flesh can enter a sacred house of the giants. They are completely free from uh, the idea of killing animals for any reason, unless it would be for great sickness or terror on the part of the animal. They would give the animal the same care and consideration that they would give a human being. Not only that, but they had an old animal's home, a kind of a, like a, a, a retirement community for ancient animals that would otherwise be killed. At one time, they had somewhat over 800 quadrupeds in there going through these various phases of old age with dignity, well fed, cared for, and given veterinarian service. Well, this is something that's a little difficult for the Westerner to appreciate. They go further than this. They make great care of birds, and anything that is sentient to them is sacred, because nothing can be sentient unless the divine spark is within it. This led to a little contemplation of the matter, and it becomes gradually obvious that this sect has an influence far beyond the size of its membership. The members are for the most part from the upper classes of Indian people, in the sense that they are well educated in the professional fields and they have dedications based upon solid scholarship. I think of the summary of a, gi of a giant criticism of Western life. Now, I'm not quoting them, but I'm taking their idea and putting it into Western words. It would be something like this. If there was a home with tremendous contention, family at wit's end, everybody hating everybody, what would be the Western solution? Answer, paint the house. They think that we believe that if we keep the outside up, nothing else is important. The way we dress, the way we live, the way we eat, the way we think must always be in fashion. And as fashion is 90% wrong and almost 100% a waste of time, we are not getting the most out of the philosophies and integrities which we are assumed to be concerned with. So with that thought in mind, I've been trying to think through a little bit of some of the contributions that the divine philosophy has made to the principle of harmlessness. This is ahimsa, and ahimsa is a word which means hurt nothing. Now that means don't hurt your brother, don't hurt your so-called friend, don't hurt anybody, and if you have an enemy, make a friend as quickly as possible of that person. Just simply do not harm anything with word, with thought, with deed. And do not build a career that is so competitive that you must make by the loss of someone else. Because as long as we fight things through, as long as we work on the outside only, as long as we put physical ambitions and physical achievements first on our list, there will be no peace in the world. 
Mohandas Gandhi lived for some time among the Jains, and, it and they influenced strongly his doctrine of harmlessness or nonviolence. According to these people, we have to look fairly at the facts of things. We are really living in a fantasy. And the fantasy is that everything that is important is physical. And everything that is physical is important. And on this basis, there can be no peace, no harmony, and no end of strife. We cannot achieve a brotherhood of humanity as long as we compete with each other for honors, for wealth, for opportunity, for privileges, and gain those, if necessary, by sharp practices. So the giant says, take it this way. We are here for 70, 80, 90 years, if we're fortunate. And at the same time, we are surrounded by a great vast area of non-self. We came from somewhere, and we were not there before that. We go somewhere, and the place where we were here is now empty. And in the, in, in the interval between these two periods, we live and move and create our destinies. The uh, Jain believes definitely that there is a purpose in life. They believe in the immortality of the human soul. They believe in reincarnation and karma. And they believe that the larger purpose of life is to complete and fulfill the total self. And that while we live only on the surface, while we are concerned only with superficial things, and are perfectly willing to try to succeed on a level of vanity alone, we're always going to be in serious trouble and frustrate the purpose for our own existence. So we look a little bit into some of these thoughts, and we find some other interesting things. The Jain, uh, for example, points out that our physical life is very largely influenced by our attitudes, by our emotions, but not by our thoughts, and is a constant compromise of principles in order to appear contemporary in a physical way. We mortgage the soul to project a dramatic image of the body. We mortgage our emotions in order to use the will and the energy, the resources, completely for the fulfillment of our human attitudes as appetites and desires. That we use the body. We abuse it. We make it do things it would never do of its own accord. We deprive it of the cooperation of the inner life. We make it necessary for the inner life to constantly support and defend our outer life. Every internal resource may be devoted to the advancement of ambition or the accumulation of wealth. Now, these two purposes are basically illusional because there is no permanence in them and no reality in them. We come into this world with no physical belongings except the body. And we go out of this world and we take nothing with us except the soul. Therefore, all of this struggle in between is largely fantasy. The fantasy that makes us believe that we can spend the first half of life accumulating and then settle back and accept and enjoy these accumulations in the second half of life. The uh, uh, idea of this from the standpoint of the Jain is that by the time we get through the first half and build our little pile we're sick and tired, and it's too late to even enjoy what we have accumulated. For about the time where we're going to settle down to the appreciation and use of what we have, we are tormented by the destruction we have wrought within ourselves, and also may be a little affected by bad conscience, and even most affected by ambitious relatives. The answer seems to be there's something wrong with the pattern. Man is better than the world he creates. He is better than the kind of house he lives in. He is better than his appearance. But to the Western thinker, appearance is just about everything. Everything that we can want or want is either in appearance or in fantasy to attract attention. 
We believe if you make people look at us, that that's a great achievement. What they see when they look, we don't know. Usually it's not very flattering. But we keep on living on this surface. And as a result of living on the surface, we have wars on the surface. We have desperate afflictions of one kind or another, economic collapses, psychological fatigues, broken homes, narcotics addiction, alcoholism, all these things are in some way associated with the gratification of something that is not ourselves. The human being does ne has never needed the false stimulation of narcotics. If there is a false stimulation, it is because the natural stimulation of life and its purposes has failed. This inspiration and the pressure to grow should come from the inside and not by simply bolstering up artificially by bad habits the fatigues of the body. So the dream uh, begins by considering the probability of getting down to essentials. In this sense, it was almost like Diogenes, who had the same idea among the Greeks. The one of the greatest problems we have is possession, and the other greatest problem we have is ambition. Very often they are interrelated. The fewer things we have, the more likely we are to be somebody. When we cannot hide our weaknesses behind a glamour, they become apparent. And the individual with the bad disposition is not any longer catered to simply because he is rich enough to buy a consideration. If we depend on what we are for what we have and what we do, there is a great difference between this and allowing our lives to be built upon shams. Now I think most people that know realize and do today that life is very largely a sham in politics, in entertainment, and in economics. Therefore, there is a great need for simplification. There is some way of getting out of this tremendous tension that we have brought upon ourselves. But we cannot solve the problem by increasing it. We cannot destroy a fantasy by supplanting it with another fantasy equally unreal. And the great end of all fantasies is success. And success can never be a reality until it means the victory of the inner self over the outer personality. Now this doesn't mean that the victory is a tyranny. It doesn't mean that the individual must do like some of the Indian mendicants and sit on a couch of spikes. It means, however, that the individual gradually and quietly decides where his values are. Now, many of the giants are educators, physicians, lawyers, doctors, all kinds of professions, but always with a realization that there is a profession that we follow, a job that we have, but inside there is a censorship of consciousness over conduct. And it is this victory of consciousness over conduct that is apparently so lacking today in Western culture. In fact, it's lacking everywhere, but it is particularly obvious in an affluent society. If, therefore, the individual must work from the inside out, then it is necessary to clarify values. And these, for this clarification is not, in, in the case of the Jains, so different from Buddhism. Uh, Buddha and uh, the, the first great sage of the Jains probably were contemporaries. Jainism has probably the same antiquity as Buddhism, founded about between 5 and 600 B.C. And it has many traits and qualifications and conduct patterns very similar to Buddhism. The only difficulty, is, or difference we may say, is the attitude of the Jain toward worldliness. Buddha gives us the same concept, but the Jain applies it in his daily life, applies it every day to the advancement of his own inner consciousness. He must finally decide which is the most important, what he is or what he has. Now this is a decision that everyone will make, must make. But the wrong decision has a lot of unpleasant appendices hung on to it. The wrong decision can be very bad for the health. 
It can be bad for the mind. It can destroy our emotional equilibrium. It can break our homes and tyrannize our governments and precipitate nations into wars. Therefore, the wrong kind of decision is one of the things that must be avoided. And the only way to find simply the right decision is to watch nature around you. We see how nature works when man does not interfere. And uh, we will find that most of the bugaboos that we are afraid of are not the result of natural law afflicting us, but are the result of the individual breaking natural law and disturbing the balance of nature in any one of many areas of activity. We are worried now about our petroleum resources. We are worried about almost everything. We would like to dump our waste on the moon or something of that nature. But that we should so live and so conduct ourselves that these problems are trivial has never occurred to us. We must keep on spending. We must keep on building bigger and better buildings. We had a big fire here in Los Angeles a few days ago in which a great building proved to become useless in substance because of things that people forgot. To build a 50-story building and put in no sprinkler system was simply a part of our way of doing things. The, probably the giants <laughs> these cats would probably build a sprinkler system and forget the building, not put it up at all. It would be much nicer to have a sprinkling system spread out all over the ground. They just would not do this type of thing because they knew in themselves that this would ultimately lead to some form of a disaster. All of exploitation leads to disaster. All profit is made up by the loss of something. Everything that we think and do either advances us as human beings or creates a debilitating environment for ourselves and those who care for us. Now, one of the interesting fields in which uh, the giants function, the field of harmlessness, ahimsa, has to do uh, partly with the diet. Now, to these people, flesh food is not suitable for human consumption. Now, this is something that will probably be largely di di diagnosed or misdiagnosed by various experts in this country. But one thing that we do find out through study of medicine is that too much meat can be a cause of serious problems. But the theory with the uh, uh, dying is not based on this. It is based on the concept of the human being never destroying life, that we cannot afford to build a healthy body by killing a sentient creature to feed it. Now this may develop more as we go along. At the present moment, we are not so much concerned with it. But we are concerned with the fact that a number of diseases are traceable to too much animal food. We also realize that a great deal of our trouble is due to the effect of food upon temperament. We find that the Jain, with his vegetarian diet, is far more peaceful by nature and temperament than those who are a carnivores of one kind or another. This is the main point in the, I think that interests us. The moderation of foods that cause emotional stress or create a tension that forces ambition or ag uh, anxiety or antagonism or, ter learns or turns us gradually to narcotics. The giant believes that a simple life, well lived, is all that can be expected of anyone. Because the whole fa fantasy that we live is bordered on both sides by oblivion. Uh, the the giant believes in life after death, but he does not believe that you're going to take anything with you from this world to the next, except your own soul. And if the soul has been denied, if the soul has been starved, if the soul has been violated, then there is nothing that we can take with us to compensate for the loss. It makes pretty good sense from a philosophical point of view, at least. 
Many people today take the attitude that the only time is now, and that while they can, they want to do exactly as they please. Uh, but of course, in the course of a few years, this doing as you please ends in results that do not please. The individual becomes sick or endangered or finds himself in tangles due to the misuse of his own impulses and trouble goes and with it all the way. The uh, problem of environment, therefore, is a very simple one with these people. The home will be simple. No egos, no vast extravagances, uh, no complicated and extreme fashions that cost money for taxes or construction. A simple house, a comfortable house, but a house that is dedicated to the friendliness, affections, and responsibilities of the family. It is the family that makes the home and not the house. And if the house is grand enough, the home it will suffer because it will tie the individual to a whole group of fantasies. The fantasies of having a bigger house than the neighbor. The individual gets a $10 raise and buys himself a house costing 100000 more. This is all fantasy. The house will never make him happy. It will satisfy his ambitions for a moment, but within that house will happen many things that he wishes will not happen. And they would not happen if he was basically tied to integrities. So the building is not the, set, uh, not the problem. It is the contents. In a nation, it is not the type of government, it is the quality of government that determines everything. And all things being equal, government should be as simple and economical as possible. Government should never be for the glorification of ambitious politicians. Government is a necessity in certain respects. According to the Jains, the governor must be himself a Jain or its equivalent. He must be a person of simple habits, no ostentation, and qualified for the job. All the talk, all the speeches, all the great plurals, all this is a shadow and a nothing. We, we, we lose sight of the real thing because we have created an illusion that something that is unreal is real. We think that these speeches are real even though we do not believe them. We believe that all these expenses are justified even though we know they're not. And we have a belief that if we break the law all long enough and often enough, we will create a new law by which law-breaking becomes happy. This is also an illusion. Whenever we at at attempt to reform a law away from truth, we are creating more trouble for ourselves. The problem is to simplify and rationalize our experiences so that we live to grow, that we live to fulfill the destiny of a spiritual divine spark within ourselves. It is the God in us that must be our hope of glory. It is the eternal spirit in us that we must build with and build for, and not merely for the advancement of external conditions. We can never make the God in us happy if we have an unhappy home. We must live the principles of reality or the realities will not protect us in time of trouble. Now, many sects and teachings have this uh, belief. Buddhism has it, Hinduism has it, Muslimism has it. But always, in almost every case, the faith falls into the keeping of people with ulterior motives. Instead of being the pure, simple faith that was in the beginning, the great institutionalization starts, and it becomes a, a, at least apparent to some that God's re God rejoices in extravagant architecture, when in reality what he wants is the honest heart of human beings. He wants the honesty of man, not the extravagance. He does not wish to be worshipped with great ceremony, but worshipped by honest, simple, gentle, constructive living. 
So from one of this little sect way off in India comes a message that seems to be uh, very valid. It is the message of, of the recognition of where true value lies and rests. One of the most beautiful temples that I saw of the giants was in the Mount Abu area, uh, which is in uh, Rajasthan. Uh, this temple uh, is called the Dilwara temples. It is a cluster of temples and sacred buildings on the side of a great hill. The buildings themselves are practically solid marble. They are not great size, but of great beauty. The domes of these temples are probably the finest known examples of carved marble. On one of, one of these domes, there is a frieze of racing horses around the entire inner life side of the dome. All kinds of figures, and from the same piece without detachment in the marble, for the great chandelier from the same piece. The buildings are incredible. They're incredible because they represent, probably, the work of great artisans who got nothing for doing it, who were not paid, but who were permitted to worship by the creation of beauty. Now this beauty must, however, have a purpose. This beauty must not be for secular purposes. Beauty is in itself a sacred manifestation of a divine presence. True beauty is worship. The truly beautiful is worthy of worship. And it receives that worship not because of a conscious effort of our will, but because of the admiration and adoration that arises spontaneously within ourselves in the presence of that which is above our, even our, our understanding. So the Dilawada temples are a magnificent center in which many thousands of pilgrims pass every year on their service of, of pilgrimage to their faith. Uh, Zionism is a religion of pilgrimage also. And why should it not be pilgrimage? Because life itself is, not more, is a pilgrimage. And a little pilgrimage inside of the greater one is quite suitable. The pilgrimage of the soul may be through hundreds of bodies, but one of those bodies is the one we are in now. And therefore, pilgrimage is the journey in this world to help us to discover the reality. The pilgrimage is to prove conclusively the importance of finding the good. The individual is dedicated to finding that which is real, to a himself which is really nothing more or less than complete sacrifice of the personal, harmlessness. Therefore, the pilgrim goes forth not in the name of deity, because that name is not even necessary. It is present in the individual. But he goes through the cities, the towns, and the countryside to find two things. One is to find his place in a divine plan rather than in a human plan. As long as he sits in a city, he is going to be a victim of a city plan. And this plan is the final absurdity of complexity. Therefore, he is going to go into the country. He is going to go where nature still has a voice in the running of things. He is going to walk along the dusty roads where poor people labor every day. He is going to join the laughter of children. He is going to watch the natural growth of beauty as it is and find his understanding, his insight, and his confidence in the divine plan stronger and better because he has journeyed through a little part of a divinely created world. And he becomes more and more understanding as he proceeds as to what man has done to that world. He sees how the simple people live in their little cottages and live the normal life that is possible. He sees these great conglomerates of cities, 15, 20 million people, in a mass of complexity. The uh, traffic so bad they can get nowhere. And he can point out that this is the traffic is the symbol of a complex world, a complex world that can never go anywhere. To get the complexity out of life, therefore, is to get it out of yourself. 
to get out of yourself the need for anything artificial, the need for any stimulant, the need for any possession that detracts from freedom. Freedom is freedom from things, freedom to worship without ulterior motive, and freedom to take self-interest out of the rituals of faith. These things become very interesting to uh, people who have perhaps suffered long from the sorrows of worldliness. So we get to the problem that probably interests everyone more or less, and that is health, and the attitude of these people on the matters of health. Health must be a proper relationship between the inner life and the outer body of the individual. The body is a kind of a house. The body is a vehicle, Vehan called it in India, by means of which the inner life manifests for a little while in this physical world. The body, therefore, is like a temple. You build a good temple, you dedicate it, you maintain it. You build a good body, you abuse it and lose it. Now the body itself is a temple. And that is well pointed out in this old play that we have here in this country, The Servant in the House. It is this building that we have built, a built without hands, a building that is built by an inner life moving out through us. We get this house and we build it. We maintain it partly. And then we begin to abuse it. And as soon as we are old enough to do wrong, we start. And we keep on doing wrong until we wreck that body. And we are doing it now with narcotics and various abuses. We are doing it constantly by worry, agitation, and dedication to exploitation. We are trying to build an outer wealth in a universe that does not understand such rules. We are on a little ball moving through space. And whether we make a billion dollars or not does not mean anything in space. It is only our own ability to gloat over the small things that we do which prevent us from realizing the great thing we could be, a, a true human being. So between man as he is now and his own humanity must lie an interval of illusion, an, an interval of fantasy, an interval of belief in things that are not real and are not true. Now the giant may go a little further in these things than we have to. For the giants, it means all kinds of things. For one thing, there is one sect of the giants which has given up clothing. And a tropical country makes that quite feasible from a physical standpoint. But we can hardly imagine that happening here, although in some cases we're getting very close to it. But in any event, they say that uh, clothing is a little sordid luxury. Well, probably it isn't necessarily and I think no giant will interfere or criticize simple, dignified dress. But I don't think that uh, the giants would have much interest in high styles or all this business that we do to glamorize the outside and leave the inside suffering from pernicious anemia. We need to get our values straight. We need to use what we have to increase what we are. We need to have thoughts and attitudes and beliefs and convictions that bring us together as human beings, that we are not competing with each other for who has the biggest house or the newest car. The problem is to have what we need, use it well, and share our inner life with all who can benefit from it. So we find the giants very simple. They don't use the jewelry, they don't use any of these things. We don't say you have to go to any such extreme as this, but when you have trinkets, admit they're trinkets. Enjoy them, but do not commit crime to get them. Do not make a bad marriage in order to get a bankroll. Do not do anything from ulterior motive, but be happy with simple, factual things and realize that a true and sincere friend is beyond value and that a close and understanding and sympathetic family is the greatest treasure since the house of the Grashite. So when the emperor asked, 
for the fortunes of the house. The mother brought her children, said, this is my wealth. And that is the kind of thing that the uh, Dines work with. The idea that wealth is the fulfillment of responsibility, the presence of peace, the presence of understanding, the charity of things, the willingness to do whatever is best for the other rather than forever the convenience of ourselves. Great convenience is destroying, destroying us, but uh, this idea of not having the possessive factor, the c cultivating harmlessness, is a great virtue. Now let's think a little bit about what was meant by harmlessness. Harmlessness is, is, you, is, is freedom from misuse of whatever it may be. It to be constantly in the presence of the abuse of value. When we uh, harm something, well, today there is a great deal of harmfulness in the air. We destroy each other's cities, we destroy each other's works of art, we betray each other with bombs and weapons. What do we gain? More bombs, more weapons, more death, more death, more misery. Why has it been that a people or a human race, with a history such as we have had for thousands of years, has never caught on to the fact that something was wrong? That the wrong was not simply that the wrong side won the battle. The wrong was that there was a battle at all. It isn't that the other fellow is better than we are. It is back actually the fact that not, neither person is better unless it results in peace. Always we have to recognize, therefore, that harmlessness is arbitration of all difficulties. The harmlessness is the idea that we find scattered throughout both Testaments of the Bible, to do those things which are hurt to none and a benefit to all. Now, to be a benefit to all means may, may be to overcome selfishness a little bit. And selfishness is a virtue or a vice that we're going to cling to as long as possible. Self-interest is now the great motivating power. And also this self-interest is now manifesting its supreme weakness because in the name of self-interest we're using drugs that will destroy us within five years. Why? Because in those five years we will feel ten feet tall. But at the end of the five feet, at the end of the time, we will lie six feet deep. There is no, uh, no solution this way. The, the idea of wealth and all these things that we cherish are actually forms of intoxication. They are drugs, psychological or literal. They are ways in which we deceive ourselves into thinking when happy while the miseries are piling up. Therefore, the idea of harmlessness means not to injure ourselves, not to destroy the body that has been given to us, but to protect it as we would protect anything of value and anything of importance. That we should constantly try every way possible to keep the peace and keep the truth. Now, the uh, actual work of the Jain community is that, uh, whether the, you see most of it, is that the very simple nature of the faith is not one that requires constant atten attendance to any particular uh, denomination. It would be something that anyone, regardless of their religious belief, would find acceptable. Namely, that there is always hospitality. There is always the sharing of modern, uh, moderate things. There is always friendliness and a recognition of the basic unity of all that lives. And this unity reaches out to include the creatures of all of the other sentient worlds. There is a story about a Hindu holy man who was seen passing an anthill. He paused long enough to crumble a little of his bread and toss it in so the ants would have something to eat. We don't need that necessarily here, but it is a spirit. It is a spirit of sharing and giving, a respect for life. And if, as Burbank pointed out, 
we were correct in the raising of flowers. There would be no insects bother them. But we would need nothing to protect the rose from the aphis if it was not that we have that damaged the life protection that nature gave that rose. We have done something with the rose we should not have done, and it has lost its power to protect itself. And it is the same way with human beings. When we do things to them that destroy their defense mechanisms in biology and physics, then they are open to all kinds of ailments. Ailments are painful and expensive and they should be avoided. But you cannot break the law constantly without the law finally moving in on you. So the only answer is to re so regulate life that we are not going to be victims of our own mistakes. Now this does not mean that we would have to go as far as they do in their idea of harmlessness. We probably can't at this particular time. But it means that we can begin to curb by reflection some of the mistakes that we make. We can say to ourselves, I'm saving up a little money and uh, in 10, 15, 20 years I'll probably be gone. Now what's going to happen to the money? Is I'm going to leave it to my children? Yes, possibly. But in your heart, do you believe that these children will use it well? There'll be grave doubts. I've talked to a great many people making wills who know perfectly well that anything that they leave will be abused. Or what else there is to do with it? The answer is, if it is gained honorably, use it for the common good. Do not be deceived, however, by leaving it to some extravagant organization that will waste it or contrive to take care of it for their good. But so arrange your affairs that you know where it is going to go, what good it is going to do, and whether or not it will fulfill the purposes that you intended. In the same way of employment, when you enter looking for employment, what the employment is best? The answer is the employment which most fully expresses yourself. Now it is often hard to do that under the present conditions where jobs are few and the candidates are many. But there is always one possibility, and that is to try and select something that is useful. Choosing you something that is helpful and useful, even though perhaps the financial return is not quite so favorable. Always think in terms of quality, and the qualities that you create will take care of you. This world now is filled with lonely people, and it's filled with people who have tried hard, many are hurt, many are disillusioned, many are sick. They are the result of what happens in a world of fantasy a world of things that never were true and never can be true, but a world which suggests that the easiest way to get out of it is to play with the rest. Do it they, they, their way, or they will penalize you even while you're alive. Well, very few people are penalized and to the degree that they cannot, to some degree, uh, determine their own state of life. If you can't do it on the outside, the most important is to do it on the inside. Make certain that the soul sit, sits comfortably in the body. Make certain that the soul is not disturbed by arguments, dissensions, and mystery dramas on TV. Make sure that the inner life is not perturbed by hard rock music or something of that kind. Surround yourself with as much harmony as possible so that this harmony can help to protect the person that lives in the body. Actually, the person in the body now has very little chance of expression. The uh, surface is so cluttered that no one wants to pay any attention to that still small voice of conscience that gets stiller and smaller every day. But we have the right to so live that the inner life can speak, that it can to give us a directive. If we are quiet and do not try to force attitudes upon our inner lives, we will let the inner life release attitudes to us and through us. 
if we make all our decisions on the outside and force these decisions upon the soul living in the body, we have a sick soul already. It has no chance to become the basis of growth, improvement, peace, happiness, or security. It is forever penalized by the pressure of the mind, which is the creator of illusions, but can become the support of simple, simple truth once we understand it. So we are now living by forcing the outside on the inside. The giants say we'd be better off if we force the inside on the outside. In fact, we wouldn't have to force, just give it a chance. If they give the best of us a chance, the rest of us will follow. So in their simple way, in their little villages and towns and communities, they simply live to make possible the, the growth of the life within them. They know that they have lived before, they're perfectly certain of that. They know they have come into this world now to learn something new. Pariment is a kavansari, a place of rest for the night, a place for pilgrims to stay, and that we are all pilgrims moving from one body to another along the path of life. That is, a, a, we are all on a pilgrimage. We are on a pilgrimage from here to eternity. We are on a pilgrimage from now to then. And that pilgrimage is one of instruction. We are traveling the world of learning. Learning to live. Not all learning out of books, but learning out of the conscience and consciousness within ourselves. Learning what real love is and what it is not. Learning what truth means, even though we may not possess it. We can perhaps be possessed by it. We want to know all these things in their full and, and proper light. We want to know that all ambitions must ultimately be transmuted into aspirations or the pains will keep right on. That out of aspiration comes the, the instinct to grow, the instinct to grow lovingly and wisely. The giant moving through the community performs all kinds of simple services, religious and secular. Uh, without thought of reward or without any hesitation over whether it is a member of his own cult or not. He is out simply to know that the only way he can grow is by growing. And the only way he can achieve his end is by so living that he can fulfill his end in his own nature. When he realizes this and starts living that way, harmlessness is the fall is that follows. Harmlessness is the individual who does not hurt even the most simple and elementary form of life. The refuges that the, the giants have created for animals, according to Mr. Bissett, one of the historians of the subject, has a room in it to take care of old, tired, and worn out insects. Now, uh, we have a way of doing that too with the place water. Well, we're not saying that uh, we want to do that, but the idea is simply a, a, an extension of our responsibilities to each other. All things that live have a meaning of some kind. We may not understand it, and for our purposes and in our way it may be an impediment to us. But everything that lives, lives for a reason. And everything that we do is for a reason. And while we may not be put into, into an old age home for insects, we still have to build an understanding and a sympathy for life. And today there is no real sympathy for life. But the condition of the, stock, of the stock exchange shows that we're not very tender about each other. And that's only a one aspect. Another aspect is the slaughterhouse for animals. They're both creature creations of profit. They have no consideration for humanity as such. Everything is in terms of dollars and nonsense. And we all become part of it. We die of misery when the stocks go down. We are elated when they go up a little. When actually it is all past of a strange world of unrealities that is more difficult to rationalize than Alice in Wonderland. Actually, 
we are here primarily for one purpose only, and that is to release the God in us, that it may become part of the God in the world, that it will become part of the God in all the faiths and in all other human beings, and that the time will come when the love of God will have victory over the hatreds of men. There is no other way. We are thinking now of all kinds of ways to train it, and all the way kinds of ways of solution. We have another election coming up, but the, to the dying people, we've got to find whatever it is that is according to the laws of heaven. We've got to rule each other and ourselves by universal law, and not by the little statutes that men put in books. Sometimes maybe their statutes are pretty good. We we'll learn that too. But for the most part, we're trying to solve the, the problem of the outside from the outside, and it cannot be done. It will get worse. The computers will get bigger. Everything will become more and more complicated because the individual is not thinking in a loving way of the needs of the rest of humanity or the needs of the ascension world to which he belongs. He doesn't realize that there is a one life pattern behind everything. There is only one life, and it must be protected. And those who attack or assail that one life in any of its forms bring down upon themselves a comic reaction. The purpose of life is fulfillment. Even if it's the life of an insect, there is something to fulfill. These little creatures were not built for the fun of it, or just simply accidents along the way. The more we study them, the more we realize that the infinite detail wonders, unbelievable complexities in the ordinary housefly. We do not know what to do about these things, and we probably won't for the while. But we can remember just this one point, that there is something behind form that is more important than form. And if we will gradually change the human pattern, the rest of nature will adjust very easily uh, to the constructiveness in humanity. For man is the steward of nature in this particular world in which we live. And that's, this world is one of great wonder. I remember Thompson Seaton used to tell me about the proofs that he had in various ways that to animals, human beings are gods. Just as man in this mysterious way turns to the invisible God for st strength and succor, so the animal in its emergency nearly always turns to the human being. Man is the god of the beast. He is the thing that the animal world must turn to in an emergency. And when he turns to it now, of course, it's open season on hunting, and that's the end of the animal. These things have to change. When we destroy life just for sport, then there's something wrong with us. There's something that isn't coming through. And the thing that isn't coming through is the divine life that so loved the world that it created these animals and turn them over to our tender mercy, and our mercy is not tender. Therefore, we are still faced with the problem of finding out why these creatures exist. What is their purpose? What is it makes, that makes it necessary to nature to, for nature to produce this infinite complexity of life? Well, the answer is that the life behind all things is infinitely complex and is eternally manifesting through the evolving individualities that it sets and sends forth from itself. Every one of these forms of life is a quality of the infinite itself. Every one of these forms has to, has to exist as an archetype in nature, or it cannot manifest. Man did not create them. The idea that man created uh, all these other kingdoms is not, not factual. The fact is, man has created very little except trouble. And it's time for him to stop this if he wants to get along better. Now, we're coming into a great emergency in human civilization at this time. An emergency that we must all face. 
an emergency for which we're going to legislate and cross-legislate and, and go through all kinds of legislative problems as though we can actually change the course of nature from the outside. The real cause is not to, nothing to do with legislation of that kind. We've got to produce a, a revelation of the divine purpose. It's not necessarily creedal, it's not necessarily religious as we know it, but we must accept the reality of an infinite law in which we all live, and that salvation depends upon obedience to that law. No one can change it. No power can change the energy and the value and the integrity that keeps the cosmos in its orbits. It cannot, turn, it cannot change the way of space. It cannot change the Milky Way. It cannot create anything that will solve the problems of existence because creation is eternal and inevitable and not necessary to create. It is only necessary for created things to become aware of the reason for themselves. It is only necessary that man learns to live according to the laws by which he was created. Now this is going to become more apparent as we go along. With the increasing population, we look forward to a planet of eight, ten million inhabitants, eight billion inhabitants. Well, eight or ten billion inhabitants can be taken care of. Many more than that can be taken care of. But not if we continue to exploit each other. If we continue to create new machines and uh, expand our scientific horizon, but do nothing to take care of the need of the simple humanity. Uh, the more of us there are, the more humanity we have to have, or everything will go to pieces. The more we are, the more unselfish we must become, for selfishness can destroy us all. So as we get greater and greater in population, and as one by one the natural resources are reduced, we're going to come finally to the point where we have to restore a Garden of Eden or else face an inevitable, an inevitable desert which will become uninhabitable. So the little Garden of Eden is there. It always will be there. This planet can be ha a happy home for all the forms of life that develop here. There's no danger of one form be taking over because there's a law governing the development of life and there has never been any problem that needed man to tell it what to do. The problem with man is to do what he should do. In the same way in government and politics, education, religion, culture, art, music, literature, all these things move from inside. And if they are allowed to move honestly and properly, will enrich humanity. And will bring with them no hint of selfishness. We won't have individuals who refuse to write a poem unless they can get a million dollars advance on it. All this type of thing is part of a very, very serious mistake. Now, we can't expect these poor little folks that live in this world to be completely away from all these mistakes. We cannot expect a little group like the giants, oh, maybe three million, million all together, to have the power to make all these changes. We go over there and look, and there are just a few people living quietly in small towns and communities or in centers within larger groups. They have never expected to transmute the world. They have never expected to become the most powerful sect in the, in the creation of things. They've never fought with any other religion. All they have tried to do is allow the God in themselves to have something to say about the way they live. And apparently God blesses the poor because he's made a lot of them. And they seemingly have the greatest probability of serving him. The more we have, the more worldly we become. So a natural, simple, moderate way of life with what we need and the few luxuries to can take the sting out of growth, all this is possible. But this vast conglomerate of false attitudes and have false economic policies and these terrible physical ambitions of human beings who can't be happy unless they're running other human beings. All of this nature says, uh-uh, not that way. 
and it's about time that we begin to think in terms of letting the inside come out. We don't have to read it out of books. We don't have to do anything except, as Thomas Akempis pointed out, just allow the spirit to work, to allow the presence of the divine power in ourselves to express itself without putting all kinds of limitations upon that expression. If we will allow ourselves to be good, we will discover that we have always been good and didn't know it. If we allow ourselves to be peaceful, we will know we always wanted peace, but didn't know how to get it. And the only way to get rid of complexity is to stop being complex. The more we try to make more complexity for solution, the worse it's going to get. We have probably another hundred years before we get all these things simmered down, but some of them can be handled rather quickly. And they can be handled by anyone who honestly believes in the reality of a deity that loves its creation. If God is merciful, and we all assume that deity is a parent, if we do this, we will find that it is quite conceivable that we can allow the parent in ourselves to come through. Each individual is endowed with a divine factor. And it is this divine factor which we have ignored since we were pushed out of Eden in the first place, or whatever was the equivalent of Eden. At least we were pushed out of something. And uh, we have never allowed this reality to take over. We have tried to, we have prayed, we have asked help, we have done all these things, but we have so some way not created the proper atmosphere. And the reason why we pray, and our prayers are sometimes answered, is because we were justly entitled to those answers. When they're not answered, there's some reason why they're not answered. And that reason isn't that God was overlooking us that day. It is rather the fact that where we deserve, we get. Where we don't deserve, we continue to suffer. And whenever we ask to be relieved of a burden that we should solve ourselves, the burden will stay with us. But if we have so lived and so conducted ourselves that we have outgrown that burden by legitimate means, it will be lifted. Everywhere the change has to start within ourselves and has to move from there outward to the world of our environment. We're going to have to look over the problems of our homes and our family life. We're going to have to discover what constitutes an acceptable family situation in terms of divine life. We're going to have to realize that a family must live under law, divine law, and that this divine law can be administered on a human level with justice for all and love of God dominant in it. We can find any answer we want if we really want the answer, but if we merely want an excuse to continue making the same mistake we will go through one cycle of depressions and inflations after another. We are beginning to realize the fear of nuclear war. We are realizing that we created something we didn't understand, and never will probably understand. We created a very convenient means for self-elimination. And this creation was supported uh, by some of the worst thinking the world has ever done. But on the other hand, it hasn't happened. And now we find a gradual awareness coming that it shouldn't happen. The inside is beginning to speak. The inside is speaking in many ways and in many places. It is still a small voice for most. But the small voice may be, law, or may be small in terms of society. But that small voice, when it gets a little louder in us, is the most powerful force in the world. So that we have always had and always will have within ourselves the capacity to be right. And by following that capacity to make the world what it should be. It isn't necessary for us to go through all of the privations and trials and sufferings that have that figured the past. Look at this moment. This in trouble in every major country of the world. Everything is proving conclusively we're doing it wrong. 
Yet with all the force we have, we try to continue to do it wrong or make a few minor tucks in our mistakes so that they won't look quite so bad or maybe get a little bit of something better into them. We should be studying definitely that the whole path of humanity since the 19th century in the Western world has been toward materialism, toward the complete ignoring of the ethics of the divine purpose. We are perfectly willing to admit that the eye of a housefly is so incredible that we will never understand it. But we are unwilling to under accept the fact that there is something out there that does understand it and did create it. And we've got to find out ways in which we can do that which is right. We must become in our turn pens in the hands of a ready writer. We must find a way to come back to the simple facts of life. To live as we should have lived and to live in a way in which we can spend the years of our lives in a peaceful relationship. Now what might be one of the rewards of that? I think it's probably one of the rewards would simply be that the last 10 or 15 years of life will be happier, which we will no longer be lonely people. We will no longer be exiled from society simply by age. We will be also able to, re to reap the rewards of good thinking, good planning, and good understanding. Sometimes these little birds have to come back to roost. And what we do wrong will ultimately do wrong for us or make things very difficult. So we do realize very definite that in this life in which we are now involved, that a major breakthrough is necessary. In this patching up of things, we mean to try to do a little better, but keep them all the sins and complexities and mistakes that we have learned to consider essential. We think it essential to have bad television programs. Why? We don't know. We feel that seemingly that it's essential that our mail be smothered with advertising. Nobody really cares too much, but it all bears witness to a basic failure, a failure of the integrity in people, and a failure of the insight which causes us to stay away from that which is not good. We just pass it over and say, well, that's the way it is, and go on doing what we intended to do in the first place. So now we are on a rather an emergency. An emergency which can only be solved by some really serious thinking. Now if this solution required a new currency, or required a new system of government to be imposed upon now, it would be different. But we tried that. It never worked. We cannot be governed by anything but the spirit within ourselves and be safe. And the spirit within ourselves must not be confused with our ambitions and our avarice and our egotism and egocentricity. The, vo the voice within ourselves is always honest. And the moment it appears to be dishonest, we must suspect that we are getting the wrong message that behind the self-message that we all have, this inner ambition, this ambition for wealth, for power, for security, for happiness, for health, all these things, if this voice alone speaks, it continues to fight for that which the spirit doesn't even want. It is necessary, therefore, to transcend this voice entirely, to give up all self-centeredness and selfishness, and listen to the voice that, as a compass says, comes to us in meekness. Harmlessness is therefore a form of meekness. It is the individual admitting that from the cradle to the grave and before and after, the individual is a child in the keeping of a universal mystery. That behind all of us is a parental pattern by which we will be protected if we protect it. It will give us the needs if we will give it the soul. If we will live according to the rules of life, or the right rules of the right life, we have nothing to fear. And it is far better to fail here in monetary things 
and succeed in the universe than it is to succeed here and fail in the universe. For the simple reason, this is a moment. The universe is forever. This is an embodiment which will pass away. But the mystery is an eternal life that goes on forever. Therefore, we are either citizens of this embodiment with all its limitations, to be born and die with it, or we are citizens of eternity, part of a pattern so vast, so wonderful, so beautiful, that once we have experienced it as an adventure in our own souls, we can never lose it again. And now, for the first time, the human being is beginning to look around and becoming aware of the fallacy of error, the fallacy of selfishness, the fallacy of pretense, and the fallacy of building a, a life here. We, have been, we can rent a house here for a lifetime, but we can't build a life here. Our life is built for us in eternity. It is something that we will always have. But we can obliterate and mutilate its manifestations through the misuse of the powers and privileges that we feel that we have. Therefore, I think the little people over there in India have something to tell us. They are not theology-minded, but they do believe in one eternal spirit of good, and that man becomes as nearly perfect as he can become when he serves that spirit of good and becomes like it. When the goodness comes through him, he is growing. When the goodness comes to him, he may abuse it. But when he comes through him into his own life, into his own daily experiences, it becomes a great and wonderful power for the transformation of society. And each one now is in the presence of lessons, lessons about this. Between now and the end of the year, there will be more lessons. And they will recall for a very great thoughtfulness and a great realization and the fact that we can't talk ourselves out of a dilemma, that we must work together to solve the dilemma. There are problems in human society that cannot be solved by laws. They have to be solved by love. They have to be solved by understanding, by sharing, by brotherhood and comradeship. And until we find that out, we are missing the message that comes from within ourselves and upon which we must always depend. Therefore, I think this life of harmlessness that these people believe in is very useful to us to think about. I think it tells us something that we can start with right away. The next time someone lifts the phone, be sure the harmlessness is in your voice. And you may not want the product. You may feel it's an interruption and an, and an injustice. But actually, it is something that you can simply and quietly ignore, but never hurt. Never hurt another, never scandalize another, never carry criticisms, never do these things that are now becoming obviously more offensive. Now we are having books published every day, in, in publishing the private lives of other citizens. This is not because we are great lovers of truth, it's because the royalties are considerable. This is not from, from the inside. We do not have the right to judge anything. We have a right to be a little critical of ourselves if the need arises. But judge not lest you be judged. For as you judge others, so shall it be judged unto you. There are laws of kindness, and those have been ignored for centuries by most. But the few who are still kindly, or have been kindly, are the immortals on the pages of history. They are the ones that will never be forgotten, or the big and ambitious computers will be forgotten very quickly. In fact, there are a great many people now who can't tell you who were the principal people in World War II. Children growing up do not even know of these people. But it will be a very long time before they come to forget a few of the noble souls that have helped to make life worthwhile. It is always there is always evidence of truth trying to come through. And more of it must come through if we are going to solve the issues that confront us in the next few years. We are, very, we are coming very close to 
to the first clear revelation of this problem in terms that every nation on earth must face and can understand. This is the moment that may prove to be in time, the blessed moment the ages are waiting for, the moment in which we finally come to the realization we cannot be stupid and happy. When we get that point very clearly in our minds, we're well on the way to a better way of life. And then we can live by the God within. And we don't need to worry about creeds and sects and denominations. We can live according to the basic doctrines of all scriptures of the world, for they've all had the same message. We can begin to live them instead of talking about them. We can put our own lives in order and unite the broken families that we can and bless the help that we can give each other and begin to build for a permanent culture rather than on the idea that responsibilities must be avoided at all costs. The truth is responsibilities must always be accepted, worked with and solved. That is the secret of growth. And what is growth? Growth is the spirit within man gradually working its way out into the control of his objective life. Growth is from the inside out, and no permanent growth can come except by the release of the divine potion in man's complex constitution. Well, that's it. Now, I've got a few announcements I'd like to make. First of all, I'd like to wish you all a very happy Mother's Day. And I'm sure that in the days that come, mothers will gain a great deal more understanding than they have enjoyed in recent years. Because they are part of that which has suffered as a result of the increasing selfishness which has nominated human conduct. I'd like to announce at this time that on Monday evening at 7.30 here, the Veritas Foundation will have a workshop. My wife will be speaking. It's a friendly gathering of people interested in the very things we are talking about this morning. And I'm certainly she is going to bring into this discussion a discussion of the feminine principle of the source of existence, which she calls the space mother. And this is a very interesting and important contribution to modern thinking, and we hope that you will attend, if you can, her meeting on Monday evening as a sort of a special uh, Mother's Day celebration. So we hope to see you then.